The recognition, the appreciation, the getting the stuff is extra. What matters is you do what's right because it's right. You do your best because it's what you're capable of. You do what you think your obligations are. That's a much more resilient, impressive way to go about one's career and one's life. Well, thank you all very much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. You can have the backs of your seats. Go for it. You can, you can cough freely as well. Uh, you <laughs> all right, so I wanna take you back about 2,000 years. If we can get this rolling. Let's go back one more. I want to take you back 2,000 years to ancient Rome. There's a young man about the same age as all of you, and he finds out he's going to have a job that only 15 human beings have ever had up until this point. He's going to assume the purple, become the emperor of Rome, the most powerful person in the world. So how does Marcus Aurelius, the so-called philosopher king, how does he survive this? How does he escape the temptations, the corrosive nature of power and fame? How does he deal with what is one disaster after another? He deals with the Antonine Plague. He deals with a series of historic floods. He deals with an endless number of wars on Rome's borders. How does Marcus Aurelius navigate the strains and stresses of power? How does he rise to the occasion and become one of the great leaders in all of history? Well, we know that he turns to Stoic philosophy. We know this because Meditations, his, his book, it's a remarkable work here. This is the private thoughts of the most powerful man in the world. And we see Marcus wrestling with his role, his job, his duty, his obligations, and himself in the pages of meditations. And what guides him through this gauntlet, through this crucible, through this incredible test, is what he calls the touchstones of goodness, what we call today the cardinal virtues. He says, if at some point in your life you come across anything better than justice and wisdom, self-control and courage, he says it must be an extraordinary thing indeed. Cardinal has a religious connotation today, but cardinal comes from the Latin cardos, which means hinge, courage, discipline, justice, wisdom. These are the things that the good life hinges upon. And it's been the honor of my life to do this series on the cardinal virtues. Now this is my third year here. I started with courage. We went through to discipline. And today we're gonna to talk about justice. After my first lecture, you guys were nice enough to give me a, a compass. And as you know, the cardinal points on a compass, the four points on a compass, north, east, south, west, also share this idea, the cardinal directions. These are how we guide and direct ourselves through the ocean of life. And today we're gonna to talk about justice. And when we talk about justice, we're not talking about the legal system, we're not talking about judges and juries. This is obviously part of what justice is, but we're talking about something both much simpler and much higher. We're talking about, as Cicero said, the virtue by which a good person gains the title of good. We're talking about the virtue that all the other virtues must be directed at. Cicero would talk about how courage in pursuit of the wrong cause or pursued the wrong way obviously becomes something other than virtue. So justice has to be the virtue that all the other virtues are directed towards. It has to be the North Star that we direct ourselves, our lives, and our actions towards. Marcus really said that life was good character and acts for the common good. That's the discipline of justice that we're gonna be talking about today. And we can start, I think, somewhere very simple, right? Good character, the actions, or the standards that we hold ourselves to. Former Secretary of Defense, four-star General in the Marines, General Jim Mattis, calls these your flat-ass rules, right? What are you willing to do, not willing to do? What do you hold yourself to? 
What are the standards that you believe in? And Marcus gives us some of these in meditations, as a matter of fact. Again, what he's doing in meditations is reminding himself of what he believes and what's important in the way that I see the notebooks that some of you are holding, right? The act of journaling, the reminding, him, of him, the reminding himself, the dialogue with the self about what matters. He says, never regard something as doing you good if it makes you betray a trust or you lose your sense of shame or it makes you show hatred, suspicion, ill will or hypocrisy or a desire for things best done behind closed doors. And then in the same passage, this is all the same page where he's riffing on the cardinal virtues. He says, how to act, never under compulsion, out of selfishness, without forethought, with misgivings. Don't gussy up your thoughts, no surplus words or unnecessary actions. Let the spirit in you represent a man, an adult, a citizen, a Roman, a ruler, taking up his post like a soldier and patiently awaiting his recall from life, no needing, needing no oath or witness. Cheerfulness without requiring other people's health or serenity supplied by others. He says to stand up straight, not straight. So we have in meditations, Marcus really is writing for himself, his definition of justice, his flat ass rules, his standards for behavior and standards of excellence. Truman, one of the underrated presidents, he would, who would carry a copy of meditations with him most of his life, would formulate a, a code that helps him navigate what was at that time an era of corrupt machine politics. He would say, in my long career, I had certain rules I followed, win, lose, or draw. I refused to handle any political money in any way, whatever. I engaged in no private interest, whatever, that could be helped by local, state, or national governments. I refused presents, hotel accommodations, or trips which were paid for by private parties. He said, I made no speeches for money or expenses while I was in the Senate. I lived on the salary I was legally entitled to and considered that I was employed by the taxpayers and the people of my country, state, and nation. No one demanded that Truman live up to these standards. And in fact, this was the exception and not the rule of his time. But these were standards that he set for himself that he followed whether people were watching or not. Let's put it real simple. M McCain, class of 58. I don't accept special treatment. In the Hanoi Hilton, they find out his father is theater commander. They offer him a chance to leave early, essentially to cut in line. I don't accept special treatment, right? So we have these flat ass rules so we can turn to them so they can guide us in moments of temptation, of stress, of success, and of adversity. So when we think of justice, we wanna think of justice more as a verb than a noun, right? Not as something we get, but as something we give, as something we hold ourselves to, that we live and we act with, again, whether it is appreciated, understood, or even noticed, right? What line are you holding, right? When we say hold the line, what is that line? Not the line you're asked to hold, but the line that you feel is important that you won't cross. A real simple one, let's, let's call this keeping your word, right? I keep my word. There's a Roman general in the third century BC named Regulus. He's fighting in the first Punic War and he's taken prisoner by Carthage. He spends seven years in a prisoner of war camp, not unlike the Hanoi Hilton. And finally, as the war reaches sort of a stalemate, Carthage sends him home as part of a diplomatic mission. They, they ask him to deliver potential peace terms to Rome. And so Regulus travels, he's, he's heading home, right? He's heading away from this imprisonment, heading towards his family, towards his country. And so he speaks in front of the Roman Senate and he explains the terms that Carthage is offering. And then as he finishes, he explains to the Senate that as wonderful as peace would be, his advice is that they don't make it. He thinks the war is winnable. He thinks that the offer itself is an acknowledgement of weakness and that Rome should push ahead and fight on. And Rome thanks him for his advice and then are surprised, stunned would be the word, to see him begin to pack his bags to return to Carthage. Now why is this? 
He would explain that he had sworn them to return. He says, I will not transgress my oaths, not even when they have been given to my enemies. See, there was a condition for his release. Carthage said, if you go to Rome and successfully make peace, you are free. If you cannot make peace, you have to promise to return. Now, you can imagine his wife and his family, and indeed all of Rome is flabbergasted. This was a promise made under duress. You're away, they can't possibly enforce what they promised you in those terrible conditions with all that leverage. And what Regulus says is, sure, that's all well and good. He says, if I stay here, I alone benefit, right? I have my freedom. He says, but if I fail to return, all of Rome will suffer. His point is that if he breaks his word, he personally benefits. But if he breaks his word, future generations of Roman, Romans will suffer. Future soldiers will suffer because they can't be trusted. The diplomatic process breaks down without one's personal sense of honor. And the other side of this is also true, right? The, the glory, the, the reason that Regulus is known now all these centuries later is he returns to Carthage where he is promptly crucified and put to death. So he returns to Carthage, he keeps his word, even though he knows at some level that it means almost certain death. He says, if I break my oath, I alone benefit. If I keep my oath, all of Rome benefits, right? They benefit because the message that he sent, which echoed down through the centuries to subsequent negotiations, big and small, was that you could trust a Roman to the death. So we keep our word because our word matters. And it's not always so high stakes. There's a beat poet named Danielle de Prima who's at a party, a, a legendary beat party. Ginsburg is there, Kerouac is there, there's drugs and alcohol and art. This is the kind of once in a lifetime opportunity to make contacts, to have experiences, to, to live, to learn, to, to be mentored by people. And she gets up, about 10 o'clock she gets up and says, sorry, I have to leave, I must go relieve my babysitter. Her young child was at home with the babysitter and, and Kerouac looks at her and says, if you don't forget about that babysitter, you'll never make it as an artist. And Duprima looks at him, uh, one of the most powerful artists in America at this time, and, and she says, actually, you're wrong. If I break my word to the babysitter, I'll never make it as an artist. And what she explains is that her commitment, she gave her word that she would be home at a certain time, that commitment to someone else is the same as the commitment she would make to herself each day. I'm gonna write this many words. I'm gonna work on this project. I'm gonna put in this many hours. I'm going to meet this deadline. And so the, the keeping of one's word boils down to this idea that we keep our word to others, but also to ourselves. This is discipline and justice. This is where they intersect. It, it boils down to the idea that we do what we say, and you can take that to the bank or to the death. We tell the truth. This is another rule, we tell the truth. We not only keep our word, but we tell the truth. This is Ernie Fitzgerald, Air Force officer, takes a job in the Pentagon, where he slowly uncovers all sorts of waste and corruption and inefficiencies, the so-called $3,000 toilet seats, the $800 hammers, this is all comes from the revelations of Ernie Fitzgerald. And so, having made these public to a number of politicians, he's asked to speak in front of Congress. Now his superiors don't like this. They'd like to, you know, keep the dirty laundry in house, as they say. They, they urge him to, to handle his problems internally, to not reveal the full extent of the problem to the public. Now there was never a chance of Ernie not doing this, but his wife tells him that I can't live with a man that I don't respect, and if you go out there and lie, I can't respect you. And so he goes in front of Congress and he speaks the truth. He, he actually hated the term whistleblower. 
said, I'm not a whistleblower, I'm a truth teller, I'm doing my job. Like Truman, he believed he was employed by the taxpayer and that's who his obligation was to. The thing is though, we say we like whistleblowers, we say we like truth tellers, but in truth, we, we don't. Uh, it never goes well for these folks. It is never easy. They are rarely received or embraced with open arms. That's why it takes so much courage, right? There is physical courage and moral courage, the courage of the whistleblower to stare down powerful people and speak the truth as they say it is a powerful thing. Nixon hears of Fitzgerald's revelations, his truth, and doesn't say, thank you, sir, for your service. We have tapes of Nixon saying, get rid of that son of a bitch. Ernie Fitzgerald becomes the most hated man in the Air Force. He's ultimately fired by Nixon. He sues Nixon for costing him his job. It's a critical lawsuit that goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Alexander Vindman, Colonel Vindman, both he and his brother lose their jobs for the truth that he tells. He's on very special phone call, and he speaks the truth, and it leads to the impeachment of the President of the United States. So again, in both cases, these men speak the truth and invite the animus of the most powerful man in the world. So again, courage and justice are linked in this way. But without truth tellers, without the people who have the courage to do this, to speak up, to keep their word, to follow their flat ass rules, you see something, you say something, we are lost. And real leaders, great leaders, know this. Admiral Rickover, class of 22. He gives a famous speech where he says, if a subordinate agrees with their superior, he is a useless part of the organization, right? Rubber stamping, not speaking up, not saying the truth as you see it, not sharing information, this hurts the organization, it hurts the unit, and it hurts the country. Rickover was famous for telling a story about Admiral Sims, class of 1880, who was on a posting in London, calls an officer, into his office, they've been working together for several months, and he says, I'm really unhappy with your performance. And the officer says, what are you talking about? I'm doing a great job. What have I done wrong? And Sim says to him, in all the time that we've worked together, you haven't disagreed with me once. And the point is, there's no way that he didn't disagree with Rickover or any officer. There's no way that Sims was right all the time. This person was just reluctant to speak up about it. So we speak the truth because it is what leaders need. A, 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 an officer can't make the right decision. A CEO can't make the right decision. A politician can't make the right decision if the truth, if the facts on the ground aren't bubbling up to them. And in fact, this is what primes Marcus Aurelius to become the emperor of Rome. Marcus Aurelius has no genetic relation to Hadrian. He's a young boy in the court of the emperor, and he develops a reputation for telling the truth. You know the story of the emperor who has no clothes, right? The little boy is the only one brave enough, smart enough, unjaded enough to, to, to say what is obvious to everyone. This is Marcus Aurelius in the court of Hadrian, and Hadrian nicknames him uh, Verismus, the truthful one. And it sets in motion his eventual ascension to the purple. And yet, even this idea of speaking the truth, which is important, Mark Schuess writes in Meditations that we must speak the truth as we see it. But so often, I think we use this as an excuse to be an asshole, to give unsolicited criticism or to attack people. It's more complicated than that, right? Justice is also about empathy, about compassion. He says, speak the truth as you see it, but with kindness, with humility, and without hypocrisy. The most powerful man in the world is reminding himself to speak the truth as he sees it, but with kindness, with humility, and without hypocrisy. So Rickover has an interview with a young naval graduate, class of 46, <laughs> young man named Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter wants to serve on nuclear submarines, and the way through that was a notorious interview with Hyman Rickover. These interviews would often last for as long as three hours. They would talk about literature and physics and history. 
He would put them through their paces. And towards the end of the interview, Hyman looks at young Carter and says, how did you stand in your class, the Naval Academy? And he says, I was 60th in a class of 800. But then Rickover pauses and says, okay, but did you always do your best? Did you always do your best? And Carter wants to say yes, as we all instinctively and naturally want to say yes. We want to believe we gave it our all. But Carter catches himself and he, in a moment of self-awareness, notices that it's not quite true. There were moments he could have pushed harder, more work he could have done, questions he could have asked, assignments he could have volunteered for. And he says, you know what? No, sir, I didn't always do my best. And Rickover looks at him and says, well, why not? And then he signals that the interview is over and leaves the room. And Carter would say that this question haunts him for the rest of his life. He says, I've never been able to answer that question. Why hadn't I always done my best? He would title his first campaign memoir, Why Not the Best? Why aren't we not giving our best? So what does this have to do with justice? Well, the Stoics say that we're all put here for a purpose. We're all put here for a reason. We all have something that we were designed to do. He says that's the goal of all trades and all arts, that the thing they create should do what it was designed to do. The nurseryman who cares for the vines, the horse trainer, the dog breeder, this is what they aim at. In teaching and education, what else are they trying to accomplish? To help one become what they are meant to become. Carter was struck as a young man by the parable of the talents. I don't know if you know this story from the Bible. Three servants are given a sum of money by their master. One invests it wisely and doubles it. The other more slowly manages to increase it. And a third is so scared of the responsibility that he buries it underground until the master returns. Each returns the sum of money. In two cases, it's larger. In one, it's exactly the same. And the parable of the talents is this idea that we are given something. We are given raw materials, and who we are is what we manage to do with that. I think it's fitting that it's called the parable of talents, talents being a money and a unit of measurement of money in the ancient world, but it's really about talent. It's a parable about talent. You've been given gifts. What do you make of them? Carter would say, I gather from this episode that we should use to the fullest degree whatever talents or opportunities we have been given, preferably for the benefit of others. And each of you is here not so much because of what you have done up until this point in your life. You are here because of what that signals about what you may be able to do, what you have the potential to do. That's why the government invests this money in you. That's why these teachers and professors invest the time that they do. They expect a return. Each of us is a prophecy. The saying goes, will we fulfill it? And what are we depriving the world of if we don't? If we don't give our best, if we don't reach the potential we are capable of reaching. Oscar Wilde said that the aim of life is self-development to realize one's nature perfectly. That is what each of us is here to do. The problem is nobody tells us what this nature is and we spend our life slowly, steadily figuring it out. Some of us figure it out early. For some of us, it is more obvious than it is for others. But we are here to realize that potential to make that prophecy real. Carter makes his way all the way to the presidency. Was he our best president? I don't know, that's a complicated question. I would, I would argue he was actually a, a very underrated president, a great president who accomplished a lot. But I'm much more interested in what Carter manages to do with the time that he had, with the assets that he had, and the fact that he did his best. I don't think anyone thinks he left anything on the table. And what's most interesting to me about Carter is who he manages to become after the presidency. He is, I think, unquestionably our greatest ex-president. He cures diseases in the third world. He's building houses into his 90s. He's a great man out of office. He's a good man in office, but he is a great man out of office. And you could argue that this is ultimately what he was put here to do, to model that. We don't know what we're here for. We don't know what that prophecy is, but the work of our life 
is figuring it out and realizing that potential. And I know many of you are at the phase in your life, in your career, where you are searching for mentors, people to guide you, people to help you fulfill that potential. And this is wonderful. Marcus Aurelius, as I said, becomes emperor, but it's, a, it's an unusual succession plan. So Hadrian senses that the boy is too young to become emperor right away. So he adopts an older man named Antoninus on the condition that Antoninus in turn adopt Marcus Aurelius. Given life expectancy at this time, Hadrian probably expected Antoninus to live for three or four more years. Instead, Antoninus lives for, for more than two decades. So Marcus Aurelius is a two-decade apprentice under a great and wise man. Admiral Michelle Howard, class of 82. She would call this the transference of wisdom. She would say that you can either figure it out on your own and stumble, or you can talk to someone else who has the same shared experiences. This is what mentorship is. This is more the virtue of wisdom. But I bring this up to plant a seed in you. So we seek mentorship. We seek allies. We seek patrons, people to help us advance in our careers. And we need this. There's no way to get ahead. There's no way to learn the essential lessons that we need to learn without this guidance. But as we do this, we are incurring a debt. In fact, you may have already incurred this debt, a debt that you can never pay back, but you have to pay forward. General George Marshall was a great man. He accomplished a lot. He was Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army. He was Secretary of State. He was President of the American Red Cross, and he was Secretary of Defense. Some of the most critical moments in American history. But I would argue that Marshall is greatest, not even for the Marshall Plan, but for his approach to leadership. Truman said that never did Marshall think about himself. All his life in the Army, Marshall kept a little black book. And in this little black book, he would write down the names of promising young officers whose careers he wanted to help advance. Names like Omar Bradley and Dwight Eisenhower fill this book. And these are the careers, the protégés that he mentors and opens doors for. This is a, a little note. This is a handwritten order giving the command at Normandy to Eisenhower after Marshall has himself turned it down. The command of a lifetime, the thing he must have wanted more than anything, he turns down because he believes it's in the best interest of the, com of the country that he stay in Washington and Eisenhower take this job. It's the job that propels his protege to the presidency. And then you can see here at the bottom, he says, Dear Eisenhower, I thought you might like to keep this as a memento. In the moment, the career moment of his life, as this opportunity of a lifetime is escaping his grasp, he's thinking more about how happy he is for his protege than how sad he is for himself. Marshall has one of the greatest coaching trees in history. This is Eli Parker, a full-blooded Seneca Indian who is an aide to Grant. Grant has a diverse and fascinating series of aides throughout the Civil War. The famous photo of Grant writing the surrender terms with Lee at Appomattox is actually historically incorrect. Grant was too nervous, his hand was shaking, and it's Parker who sits down and writes out the surrender terms. This is Greg Popovich, one of the greatest, most winningest coaches in the history of basketball, maybe even sports. Multiple championships, multiple Olympic medals, a 20 plus year consecutive playoff streak. But why I think Greg Popovich is actually the greatest coach in the history of the NBA has nothing to do with that. It's his coaching tree. A sports writer would say that you actually can't call it a coaching tree. It's more like a coaching forest when it comes to Greg Popovich because the coaches that he coached, the players that he coached, have gone on to do such incredible things that they themselves have coaching trees that are impressive in their own right. And so Greg Popovich is a nurturer of talent. Just a few years ago, two coaches that he discovered and mentored were playing each other in the NBA Finals. He has essentially created in San Antonio a coach's university in which he graduates and trains the competition that he then has to go against. 
But to him, there is this higher mission, this higher calling, and all leaders have to think about this. Who are you in this for? If you are in this for you, you probably chose the wrong profession in the wrong university, guys, right? You chose this because you wanted to do something bigger than yourself. And at the end of your career, you're not gonna be thinking about all that you have done and you have accomplished. You're gonna be thinking about people. You're gonna be thinking about the people who opened doors for you and who you opened doors for. Who did you bring with you? Whose potential did you help unlock? Not just your own, but how did you make the people around you better? Which is what leaders do. Leaders make people better. Leaders create other leaders. As Jackie Robinson would say, it's engraved on his tombstone, he said, a life is not important except in the impact that it has on other lives. Jimmy Carter is raised in early 1900s Georgia, in the deep south, with all the attitudes and prejudices and bigotry that that would entail. So when he runs for governor of Georgia, and he runs a standard campaign for a Southern Democrat at that time, you would not have expected during his inaugural address that he would look the people of Georgia in the eye and say to them, I say to you quite frankly, the time for racial discrimination is over. This is how he starts his term as governor of Georgia. Now this is a shock, a surprise to the people who had elected him, to the people who had been following his career, to his critics and fans alike. It was not a surprise to the people he went to the Naval Academy with. Certainly not a surprise to Wes Brown, class of 49. The first black graduate of the Naval Academy who, when Carter sees him being bullied and hazed, he throws his arm around him and walks him down the hall. They would run on the cross country team together. He would write him a note later and say, I ran with you, but you were better. It wouldn't have been a surprise to the people who were on his first submarine, the K-1. They pull into the Bahamas on a refueling mission and the governor general invites them to a ball. All the officers on the submarine are invited to a bar, to a ball, excepting, of course, the non-white officers. And it's Carter's job to bring this message to the captain and the captain puts it to the crew. What do you guys think? How do you feel about it? And Carter would write in his memoir that after much debate and much cursing, they unanimously declined to participate. He says it was an indication of how racial treatment had been accepted and relished and how proud he was of his ship. It was in the Navy that the attitudes that he grew up with began to fall apart. And he began to see a wider and better world. And it's also where he begins the habit of speaking up and doing what he thinks is right. He would say later that it's impossible for me to delay something that I see needs to be done. There are people who said it's too soon, let's wait, let's take it slow. And this was never his approach and this is never how he liked to see it. And the reason is the decisions that we make when we slow walk things, when we say we'll do it later, well this affects real people in the real world. These aren't theoretical debates. And so the question of when is it the right time to do the right thing, the Stokes would say that right time is right now. The very first meeting that Carter has when he is inaugurated president at 4.35 p.m., he calls Max Cleland to the White House who'd lost both his legs in Vietnam and he asks him to be the head of the VA and then he asks him to work, to begin work on a blanket pardon for everyone who had protested or fled to Canada or evaded the draft. He said this was essential to heal the nation's wounds, that this was a, a lingering toxic issue whose time it had come to deal with. And Cleland agreed, but he was concerned about the political impact of that decision. He would tell him that he'd probably face some pretty strict resistance from the Senate. And, and Carter says, I don't care if it's a, all 100 of them that are against me, it's the right thing to do. And so they do it, and it is not a popular decision. And some people think 
that Carter lost his chances of re-election at 4.35 p.m. the first day of his first and only term. Senator Bob Kerry, who wins the Medal of Honor, would say that it was the bravest decision he'd ever seen a president make. Carter would describe his philosophy thusly, thusly. He said, I hope that history will show that I never flinched in dealing with the issues that my predecessors have postponed. Could he have waited on some of these things? Maybe. Should he have been more strategic on them? There's a discussion to be had about that, to be sure. But for him, the argument was, do the right thing while you have the chance. In fact, it was common knowledge inside the Carter White House that the way to get the president to, do, to not do something was to tell him that re-election hinged on it. Or if you tried to pressure him by telling him that something would be good for re-election, he would dismiss that issue. He didn't want political concerns to influence whether he did or didn't do something. Now again, there is a place for strategy, for planning, for timing. But the problem is most of the time when we tell ourselves we're being strategic, what we're actually doing is making excuses. We never say we're never going to do something, right? Procrastination, whether it's a homework assignment or speaking up about an unpleasant truth or making an unpopular decision, we don't say we're never going to do it. What we do is we say we're going to do it later, when we're in a better position, when we're more secure. But we don't know that this will actually happen. We don't know that we'll get a better chance. This is part of Carter's philosophy. Yeah, sure, it might be better to save some of these things until you have a second term, but you don't know that you get a second term. There's an arrogance in assuming that you do. You have the presidency now. Will you use it? Tim Walz, who's running for vice president, he serves 20 years in the National Guard, he, he articulated an interesting political philosophy recently that I, I wish more leaders would understand because everyone seems to be keeping their powder dry, waiting for the right moment, being really concerned about how things will play, how things will set up the next thing and the next thing, and what happens is we get stuck with the status quo. He says, you don't win elections to bank political capital. And this is a guy who's won multiple elections to Congress and now the governor of his state. He says, you don't win elections to bank political capital. You win elections to burn political capital and improve lives. Why did you get promoted? Why did you get this job? Why did you get this position? If not, to use the power and influence of that position. What's your job? What is your job for if not to do your job? What is the point of your rank if you are not going to use it? When Lyndon Johnson was passing civil rights, one of his advisors, just like the advisors told Carter, they said, hey, I think this is something we should wait until the second term with. I think this is going to be po unpopular. And he said, what the hell is the presidency for, right? What the hell is the presidency for if not to do what you know is right? And the point of the story isn't to wait until you <laughs> become president, as any one of you might, to do the right thing. It's to use the power inherent in whatever position you have to do what you think is right, right now. Mark Schreuer says, you could be good today, you could do the right thing now, but instead you choose tomorrow. What I want to conclude with is a reminder here that look, life is uncertain. Problems lay ahead. This is indisputable. The only certainty is uncertainty. Challenges are inevitable. We don't know what the market's going to do. We don't know what our enemies are going to do. We don't know what's going to happen in the world. We don't know what's going to happen in technology or politics. But this is also the opportunity. When Marcus really says that the obstacle is the way, he says our actions can be impeded, right? Our plans can be disrupted. We can get thrown for a loop. But he says we can adapt and convert to these purposes the obstacle to our acting. It says we can accommodate and adapt. It says the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. So when the Stoics said that obstacles were opportunities, what did they mean? Well, what they meant is that every situation was a chance to practice virtue. Every situation was a chance to do the right thing, big or small. 
And in fact, one of the most beautiful passages in meditations, Marx really says to himself, this thing in front of you, this crisis, this problem, this frustrating person, this, this evil, this disaster, whatever it is, he says, how does it stop you? He says, how does it stop you from acting with courage and discipline and justice and wisdom? How does it stop you from doing the right thing? It not only doesn't stop you, it is the opportunity. It's the chance to do the right thing in a big way, in a way that matters, in a way that has impact. How does it stop you? It doesn't stop you. It presents you the opportunity to do it. Admiral Stockdale, class of 47. He's shot down, his Skyhawk is shot down and he parachutes into North Vietnam knowing he's facing capture and potentially death. But he says to himself, I am entering the world. He says to himself, I am leaving the world of technology and entering the world of Epictetus. He sees this as an opportunity to test in the laboratory of human experience the philosophy that he discovered in the Navy, Stoicism. And there in those horrible conditions, when he was challenged and deprived and tortured, he thought not so much of himself, but what he could do for others. He saw the obstacle as the way, the famous Stockdale paradox, the accepting unflinchingly the terrible reality of your situation and accepting simultaneously the opportunity inherent thereof. The opportunity to turn it into something, into a platform, into a vehicle, into a chance to do something that in retrospect you wouldn't trade away because you made it good. It was not good, you made it good. And that's what he did there. That's what he did there. And so again, what lies before us is uncertain except for the fact that it will be challenging and tough and it will be challenging and tougher for some of us than others. We don't know what lies ahead for each of us. But we know that justice is not an easy virtue. We know that it challenges us. We know that it asks things of us that are not easy, that will cost us, that will be painful. And yet what justice also offers us is a guiding light. These virtues offer us a north star, a compass, something to find comfort and clarity in, right? Something to guide us when all seems lost. Stockdale would say that a person's integrity can give them something to rely on when perspective seems to blur, when rules and principles waver, and when you're faced with the hard choices of right and wrong. It's something to keep them on the right track, something to keep them afloat when they're drowning. That's what these rules, that's what these standards, that's what these lessons, that's what these codes are all about. So as I conclude, I'll give you one more lesson from Rick Over, how he tended to finish phone calls. He would say this before he slammed down the receiver. He would say it as he pushed someone out of his door. He would end his letters with it. He would say, do what is right. Do what is right. Do what is right, right now. Courage, temperance, justice, wisdom. Thank you all very much. So Stoicism begins on a porch. That's what Stoicism means. Stoa means porch. The, the Stoa pochile, the painted porch where Stoicism begins. We can imagine the Stoics there just sitting and having a conversation. And that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm taking this Stoic show on the road this summer and fall. I'm going to be at the Troxy Theater in London on Tuesday, November 12th. On November 13th, I'm going to be at the Rotterdam Ahoy in the Netherlands. And then I'm going to be at the Convention Center in Dublin on November 15th. I'm going to be at the Center in Vancouver for Performing Arts on November 18th. I'm going to be live in Toronto at the Elgin Theater November 20th, 2024. We're going to be talking Stoicism. We're going to be talking philosophy. And I'm going to be talking about my books. And then, of course, answering your questions. I'm really excited. I've never done... I guess a world tour like this, so I'm really excited. Ryanholiday.net slash tour. I'll see you there. Thank you. We have time for some questions.
Hello. Sir, for two and fourth class saying, Echo Company in Appleton. As a stoic, what would you describe the human experience as, sir? <laughs> He's asking how I would describe the human experience. Marcus really said, life is warfare and a journey far from home. That probably describes your experience a little bit more than mine. But I would say that life is a series of events we don't control, and it's a response to those events. Are we gonna let them make them better? Are we gonna let them make us better or worse? To me, that is the question of stoicism, and that's the path that we're on. How do we derive meaning and purpose and happiness from these things that we don't control? How do we use them to do good, to have impact, to realize our potential? To me, that's what life is all about, and that's what stoicism as a philosophy is designed around. Sir, thank you, sir. I think they're up there. See up there? <laughs> Did you guys seem excited? Sir, what you for that beer? Stop down to 252. Sir, my bag will stop down. Sir, that's scary for not hanging in there when you expect life to hit a tunnel. But if before we can do it, it's consistent of a sample. You know that no light is coming, sir. Sir, what strategies do you have for continuing to put out that there is no light at the end of the tunnel, sir? There's a, uh, so he's asking, what, what are the strategies for continuing when there seems to be no light at the end of the tunnel? There's a Metallica song I like, and they said, when the soothing light at the end of the tunnel turns out to be a freight train coming your way, <laughs> which uh, reminds me of something that Stockdale talked about. Stockdale was asked who struggled the most as a POW, and he said it was the optimist that had the hardest time because they were deceived by that, what seemed to be a light at the end of the tunnel, but in fact was not. I think he was saying there was something to be said about a kind of stoic realism, uh, a sense of agency, and, and yet also a, a sense of resignation, that this sort of tension, this paradox of these two opposing ideas was essential. Um, look, when you study history, you see two things. You see this paradox again. You see the dirtiness and the awfulness and the evil of the human experience, and you also see that things tend to get better and that we eventually inevitably do do the right thing. Uh, on a long enough timeline, uh, it bends towards justice, as the quote goes. So I, 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 I think taking that larger view, having that historical experience, talking to people who've really been through things, gives you a perspective that makes you think that the long, dark tunnel that you're in is not nearly so long and dark as you think it is. Great question. Thank you, sir. <laughs> sir, we ship report class Scalzo, Kilo Company 60 for two. Sir, from what I understand, developing the four cardinal virtues about changing your mental framework. What is one question or mantra that we can repeat to ourselves daily that would help develop a framework that helps us develop in the four cardinal virtues, sir? So he's asking what's a question we can ask ourselves daily to apply this framework of the four cardinal virtues. I, I have myself become fond lately of this question from Marcus Realis that I, that I just told you. That, the question of, well, how does this stop me? So the things that we dread or we worry about or we get upset about or we want to blame that we think are problematic, to me, the, the question of how does this stop me from acting with courage and discipline and justice and wisdom is a really powerful way to reset it. So yeah, it might stop me from doing X, Y, or Z. It might disrupt the plans that I had or the thing I was gonna say or the way I was going to do things. But it doesn't stop me from my real job of being a good person, of being a person who lives by these virtues, who has this higher duty. So the smaller duties, the tactical tasks that we set out can be disrupted and impeded and blocked. But the Stoics would say that our more strategic, our deeper obligation and task and duty to, to be a good person 
to live with courage, discipline, justice, and wisdom, it, it not only can't be impeded, but it's actually, in many ways, an opportunity to do that thing on a more profound and meaningful level because of the resistance we are facing. Sir, ship and board class Sutherland, Charlie Company 52. Sir, as leaders, it will be our job to better our subordinates. How do you suggest improving the mindsets of those who have clouded judgment, sir? How do we improve the clouded judgments of the people we are trying to make better, the people who work for us? Um, look, I, I have very rarely been able to change someone's mind by challenging them head on by attacking them, by letting them know how stupid they are or how incredibly wrong they are in this moment. Um, life, like uh, warfare, is usually about outflanking, about oblique attacks, about going around. And so as we try to help people whose judgment is cloudy, I think we have more success posing questions. Uh, nudging them, helping them see, as opposed to trying to make them see, right? And so this is where the virtue of, of discipline comes in. You are triggered, you are reacting, you know the answer, but you tend to have more success with restraint and patience in bringing someone around than forcing them to see, right? Ego is a sensitive thing, we all have one. And when people's ego gets up, you know, they're kind of lost to you. But when you can disarm them, when you can, you know, go from the side or go around, you tend to have more success. Sir, thank you, sir. Sir, Alpha Gummy first, put the ship before class, Alan. Alpha Gummy first, with you. Sir, as a practicing stoic, how do we avoid being perceived or labeled as a brick wall by our subordinates or peers, sir? So how do we avoid being labeled as a brick wall or a motionless robot? Those sort of stereotypes as stoicism can be associated with. Look, I, I wouldn't describe myself as a practicing stoic. I would describe myself as an aspiring stoic. And maybe I'm just not good enough, but I've just never had that problem. As, as much as I've read about it, as much as I've talked about it, as much as I've tried to apply it, uh, no one has ever said to me, you're just handling this too well and too calmly. Uh, I'm, I'm still struggling. I, I think sometimes we, we make up problems anticipating reaching the apex of something and uh, it's unlikely we're gonna get there. It's like the person who goes into the gym and talks to a personal trainer and says, look, my concern is that I don't wanna get too buff, right? That's not gonna happen. <laughs> You're not gonna get there. Uh, so I, I don't know, I'm not that concerned about it, but I do, I do think when we think about stoicism and we associate it with invulnerability, emotionlessness, uh, un unfeeling, that's not who the Stoics were. The Stoics wrote beautiful works of art. They grieved people they loved. They aspired to do things. It, it wasn't that they were emotionless, but they did try to be less emotional in high stakes situations. And I think there, that's a distinction that we're trying to navigate. Great question. Sir, it's your fourth class carol. Us coming twice over two. Sir, how do you rectify the moral dilemma of the inherent violence and brutality of military service with the maintaining of the four cardinal virtues, sir? How do you justify the violence and brutality of your line of work with the virtues of stoicism? Look, that's not a dilemma I have personally had to navigate too much, so I, 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 won't, I won't deign to lecture you or anyone in this room on it, but the Stoics seem to see no contradiction between military service and the role of the philosopher. Marx really spends much of his reign at war. Cato serves in the military. There was a Stoic named Rutilius Rufus who was notorious for his ability to train and uh, make great troops? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that would be a question I would love to hear someone try to answer as well. Uh, but I think even thinking about it is, uh, is what the practice of philosophy is, is about. So that's a great question. Thank you, sir. <laughs> sir, 
Sir, Legitimate Fourth Pass Ortelli, November Company, 22nd platoon. Sir, in your book, you say virtue can also be described as excellence in terms of moral, uh, mental, and physical. Sir, we use those same terms in our mission. I'm wondering where they come from and how come they're so significant that they appear in the same wording in both places, sir. So he's asking about the connection between virtue and excellence. Uh, the word erite means essentially both. There is no excellence in one's profession detached from the excellence uh, as, a, as a human being. So, so being a master at something but using it to bad ends, I think, ceases to become a kind of excellence, or if it is an excellence, it's an awful excellence. The, but these classical virtues, the reason that Christianity and Stoicism share the same cardinal virtues, the reason terms like excellence, moral, physical, uh, personal, appear in your codes and as well as the codes of the Stoics is because these <coughs> classical virtues, these ideas, this is what Western society has been steeped in for generations and generations, for centuries upon centuries. And they're all borrowing from each other and building on each other. And that's a tradition that we're lucky enough to continue to this day. Okay. You, yeah. Sir, Mitchie Big Boy Club, Switzerland, Delta Company, 7 for 2. What quote has stuck with you the most, and how has it affected your day-to-day -day life, sir? From the Stoics or anywhere? Sir, the Stoics, sir. Okay, what's, what's a Stoic quote that stuck with me the most, uh, that I think about the most? Um, let's see, why don't we, let's pull one up from Meditations here. This is my copy, I have several, but I love to just flip through it and mark things. There's a, an idea from the Stoics that we never step in the same river twice, that as we come back to these quotes, they mean different things to us over different points in our lives. Um, and so you can see it changing as you are changing. Let me pick one for you that I like. Here's one. This is Meditations, Book 652. You don't have to turn this into something. It doesn't have to upset you. Things can't shape our decisions by ourselves. And then there's a passage above it, which is another one that I've, I've always loved, which I think is in some ways the essence of Stoicism. I think all of you are ambitious. All of you strive to be the best. All of you want things, this is great, as Marx really did. But he struggled with the fact that we don't control whether we get those things or not. So he says, ambition means tying your well-being to what other people say or do. Self-indulgence means tying it to the things that happen to you. He says, sanity means tying it to your own actions. Saying you focus on what's in your control. What's in your control is not your class rank, not whether you get promoted at this pace or that pace, whether you get this posting or that posting, whether my books sell this many copies or that many copies, whether they win this award or that award. What we control is what we put in, whether we give our best. Everything else the Stokes would say after that is a bonus. All right, sweet. Sir, you should be fourth class to Grima, Bravo Company, four for two. What is the courage to not dwell upon certain things that we cannot control to include other opinions of us? However, in a career where we are leaders, the people business, and their opinions of you do matter. How can one be stuck in this career, sir? Yes, that's exactly what he's saying here in this quote. How do we succeed in life when opinions from other people matter as far as advancing, growing, achieving, receiving things, and at the same time accepting the fact that these things are not up to us. There is a quote, there, the, the, the most famous play in America, in the world in fact, during the American Revolution was a play about Cato, called Cato by Joseph Addison. And this play, it's sort of the Hamilton of its day, if you will, is about a great Roman who aspires to do these things, who lives by the, the code and the, 
demands of Stoicism. And, and the, the quote in it that the founders use in multiple letters and speeches is, is this quote about how instead of trying to receive or earn a good reputation, instead of trying to guarantee a good uh, reputation, it says we cannot guarantee a good reputation, but we can do better. He says we can deserve one, right? And I talked about two presidents tonight. I talked about Truman and Carter. When they left office, neither of them was considered to be a particularly effective or beloved president. They left with very high, uh, uh, very low approval ratings. Uh, Carter doesn't win a second term. Truman decides not to run for what would be his third, but technically his second term. All, all of this is a sign that it didn't go that well for them. And yet, with time, those reputations have aged well, and they've aged well, not because they were assiduously trying to manage their public relations after they left office, but because they, the reason they were unpopular is that they'd made hard but right decisions at the time, right? They did what they thought was right. They clearly were acting on their conscience rather than for their own advancement. They clearly lived by a code. They clearly did their best. And with time, that aged well, and they actually did get that good reputation. Were they alive to see the vindication of it? In some ways, yes, in other ways, no. But it doesn't really matter. The Stokes would say that that's the third thing, the recognition, the appreciation, the getting, the stuff is extra. What matters is you do what's right because it's right. You do your best because it's what you're capable of. You do what you think your obligations are. Do you also have to have a certain amount of savvy and people skills and empathy? And do you have to play the game a little bit? Yes, of course. But if you're going around wanting to be liked, wanting to be appreciated, wanting to be recognized and rewarded right now for what you're doing, you're probably setting yourself up for a life of disappointment and frustration. If you're doing the things that are right because they're right, because that's how you sleep at night, because that's what you think you're put here to do, uh, that's a much more resilient, sustainable, and I think in the end, uh, impressive way to go about one's career and one's life. Right, thank you, sir. Please join me in thanking Scott and Peter. Of course. Yeah, I can know what it is.